podcast. Now, this week's episode, well, you know what? It could be a little bit contentious, but I really hope not. So, a while back, and it's so serendipitous that I noticed this, uh, a woman called Sinead Lynch wrote a short essay that she put on LinkedIn. Now, I don't really use LinkedIn. I totally understand why people do, uh, you know, and my very good friend, um, Roger Atkins is very, very, he's massive. He is massive on LinkedIn. He's probably one of the most massive LinkedIn people in the world. Uh, And he uses it all the time. But it's very much for, I always think of it as, you know, if you want to find a job, it's a really good way of doing it. If you're a, you know, a highly skilled professional person, you go on LinkedIn and you've got your CV on there and people know who you work for and what you did and, you know, stuff like that happens. I've never had a job, so it really doesn't... (laughs) I've always worked. I just want to point that out, listeners. I've never stopped working, but I've never had what you would classify as a job. In some ways, I'd quite like to have one. Anyway, Sinead Lynch does have a job. And what she wrote, uh, she was suggesting in this piece that the UK government could bring forward the end of sales of combustion vehicles to 2030, five years earlier than the government had recently stated and a full 10 years sooner than they had originally suggested. Now, there's nothing that surprising about this. A few other activists, pundits and engineers have said similar. I've spoken to quite a few people about it. But this piece was written by Shell's UK country chair. Sinead Lynch works for Shell. It's one of the biggest and oldest fossil fuel companies on the planet and she is suggesting quite openly and publicly and presumably with the approval of the the board and the management and the the, the corporate structure of Shell Oil she is suggesting that uh, that we stop making machines that can use the fuel they produce so I was intrigued very intrigued and I got in touch with Sinead and she very graciously uh, agreed to be a guest on this very humble podcast and I think it's a fascinating discussion. I just want to give a little bit of background to why, you know, there's some... <laughs> well, I'm going to be intrigued to see what uh, what people, how people respond to this. But so in the past, we did a, an episode about the first uh, rapid charger that Shell installed in, a, in a, a filling station in London a few years ago. That was received very well on Fully Charged, on the Fully Charged show. We then, I then did a few months later, I went to a, a thing that I'd been to before, the, the mileage marathon. So it's a student competition which is sponsored and financed by Shell to produce uh, ultra, uh, ultra efficient vehicles. I mean, to a degree that is just insane. So, um, you know, super efficient uh, petrol and electric. We did cover the electric one. That's why I went there. But petrol and electric vehicles that can do thousands of miles to the gallon, not like 100 miles to the gallon or 200 miles. No, thousands of miles to the gallon. And electric cars that can do many hundreds of miles to the kilowatt hour so really interesting engineering project for engineering students covered that because during the filming of that I was wearing a shell emblazoned driving boiler suit thing because I had a go in one of the cars we got a huge torrent of criticism that we'd sold out to shell and we were shell shell shills and uh, you know it was really bad we actually lost it was the only time in the history of fully charged where our subscribers numbers went down there's quite often periods where they kind of stay a bit static or climb very slowly this time we lost i don't know how many maybe a couple of thousand subscribers like instantly that episode went out so clearly uh for us to have anything to do with a fossil fuel company can be fraught i don't think it necessarily should be and I, and i think it's really important <laughs> that we hear from people in the fossil fuel industry and people who are really, let's face it, on the progressive end of the fossil fuel industry. Because I think it's fair to say that there are some very regressive fossil fuel companies, usually in America, uh, that have done everything they can to undermine electric vehicles. And they're certainly not uh, putting rapid charges in their gas stations across the Midwest. Anyway, so without further ado, it's enough waffle from me, let us meet the wonderful... Sinead Lynch on the Fully Charged Show podcast. Sinead, thank you for taking time to talk to us on Fully Charged. I mean, I, I, I was just blown away by that by the things that you said. So, I, it, and it's probably come become been filtered by social media, and that is actually, but what you were essentially saying, and. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm sure I'll get it slightly wrong. What were you essentially saying is it 
we we should bring forward the date that we stop selling uh, combustion cars in the UK. Bring the date nearer. Is that roughly, that is sort of what you were saying? Uh, that's exactly what I was saying. So um, the government's, you know, we've got a 2040 date already sort of announced by the government for phasing out the sales of new internal combustion engines. So the government um, came out and consulted on bringing that forward and, and their minded to date was 2035. Um, so, so uh, but we came out in, in our response to the consultation and said, actually, um, we think you can go quicker than that and you can get to a point where you can phase out internal combustion engine new sales by 2030. Um, but not, you know, bans are, are a kind of a blunt instrument. So you can have a ban, but you really do need a plan to back it up. And so, so where we were really coming from was um, we have a lot to do to get to net zero by 2050. And so there are sectors where we don't even exactly know how we're going to do some of it yet. And then there are areas where we do know what we need to do. And so where you do know us, um, you need to move faster. Um, so then you need to put in place all the various pieces of um, supply and demand support in, in policy to, to make it happen. But yeah, yeah, I, you know, we didn't do it lightly. Um, we have quite a big business in the liquid fuel side of things as Shell. So it, uh, I mean, that is why it kind of jumped out because it was, you know, I've heard plenty of people say there's plenty of pundits and know alls, you know, and, and loud mouths, people like me going, it should be 2030, you know, which has no weight and no relevance. But when someone from Shell says it, you kind of, prick up your ears because you say well actually that's very interesting because I you know you don't have to have, know anything about transportation and fuel to know that Shell's livelihood comes from selling at present sh selling liquid fuels. So, so yeah I mean we're, we're, we're a very large energy company and right now oil and gas and oil products and LNG are yeah massive part of of where our revenue comes from uh, but we're we're very uh, well we have our own net zero emissions ambition for 2050 um, and, and we're very clear that uh, the world has to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. We, we've got to we've got to tackle climate change, and that means we've got to transform nationally and globally energy systems. And energy systems are are complicated and huge, and uh, you know they they pretty much everything we everything we do and how we live uses energy. And so we've been doing quite a lot of of work on this because we're going to have to transform as well. Then, right? So you know, it's not just a matter of the energy system transforming. We're going to have to transform, and we're going to have to give customers. Um, much uh, wider offering of low carbon, low carbon fuels and, and things like EV charging, for example. So, so, so uh, we, we sat down about, we sat back maybe about five years ago and thought, okay, well, let's, let's take the 10 markets we're in globally, where we can see that the country is serious about trying to decarbonize. And, and let's properly look at what that means for that country. Um, and the UK is one of those countries. And so we've done, and when we look at like the Committee on Climate Change has done some great work on scenarios, but so have Imperial and UCL and uh, the energy systems catapults. There's all these really clever people um, showing you the different pathways to decarbonize. So we said, okay, we're in this country. We need to be part of that decarbonization pathway, which means we need to start changing what we offer customers. So in the UK, um, one of the big focuses has been rolling out EV, you know, rapid EV charging on the retail sites, um, because what we were getting was customers saying, you yeah, know, where is it? I, I want, I want to be able to, I want to be able to charge, and actually, I don't want to buy an EV if I don't feel comfortable that when I'm out and about or I'm travelling, um, that I can, I can access rapid chargers. So, so, so that was kind of the start of our journey into this. So we've got about. 80, I think, 80 rapid, um, sort of 50 and 150 kilowatt chargers on, on retail sites around the country today. The plan was to have 200 by the end of the year, but COVID has put a bit of that, bit of it, well, it'll take us till 2021 to get there now, but then we'll, we'll continue to roll it out. Yeah, but the customer demand will continue to grow. So, so it's gonna be a bit of a mix for a while, right? Customers, some customers can't afford one, some want to plug-in hybrids, but more and more, you'll know the stats better than me, more and more are buying battery electric vehicles. And so they want that network. And so for us, it's about being part of that, um, both in the retail sites, but also providing people with EV chargers for home and destination charging. So uh, it's quite a busy space for us at the moment. Uh, because I mean, I think that is the, the thing that I like about the, the approach that you're doing, <coughs> excuse me, and is the... Um, the challenges, you know, it's a huge challenge to a, to a business the size of Shell and with the, the, the history that Shell has and the, 
the relationships you must have as a company all around the world with suppliers, with drilling companies, with shipping companies. I mean, it's just, it boggles the mind. I mean, I've spoken to other people at Shell and I can tell it boggles their mind and they, uh, they work in the company because it's such a huge undertaking. But the, but the opportunities, uh, the exciting opportunities and the developments, the technological developments and the, the new business opportunities are there. It's not like, oh, we've got to stop burning oil. So it, now everything's going to be really miserable and small and not exciting and it's going to be dull. No, it's going to be, it has the potential to be unbelievably amazing, which is, I assume, what drives, you know, people who work in Shell. I'm hoping that's what's happening. And it feels like it is with your company. It is. I, and it's going to take time. Like you say, we're really large. Um, and we have... I think we've got about 500 million customers around the world today, you know, across all the different product lines. I just want to put that in context because we were so thrilled when we had 700,000 subscribers on the Fully Charged show. You've got 500 million. Yeah. So, you know, so, so, so and, and they come, you know, they're in different markets and they have really different needs. But even in the UK, you know, there's 5 million customers a week coming through our retail, our, our forecourts. So, so, so we're going to have to navigate all those differing demands and, and the way, and the way we've decided we want to do this is to offer customers choice yeah so so um because it's going to, because those customers will depending on their own sort of economic circumstances and and their own needs will will also um change at different paces um and and also we don't know exactly how some of this, this is kind of the exciting and challenging bit we don't quite know how some of this is going to go so even on something like um and and you could be pretty confident that for light duty vehicles in the uk you know there's you know battery evs are going to dominate um, I think there will still be, we can come on to some hydrogen um, cars in the space, but I think battery EVs will, will probably dominate, particularly in cities. But, but, but to what extent will people charge at home versus charging, like they, you know, some people want to do, want to charge their car like they, like they operate now. They want to go to a retail site and charge it quickly. Others don't, they, they want to charge it at the gym or at work. And so we don't quite know what, the, what that's going to look like, who, how many people are, and, and one of the kind of interesting things for me is, we know how people are charging today, but but the people who are buying EVs today are not necessarily a fantastic example of, of the, the, the broader society and the people who are going to own EVs in 2030 and 2040. So, so for us, it's about not picking a winner and, and, and not really dictating the answer, but just setting out the offerings for customers. So, you know, if you want to do it in a retail site, we've got rapid chargers, you know, the 150 kilowatts can, can charge a, you know, a BEV, you know, 80% really pretty quickly. Um, but if you want to charge at home, we bought um, a company called New Motion, which is, I think, the large, one of the largest um, suppliers of EV charging chargers in Europe. And so New Ocean can supply you with a home charger or a charger in your office or for a gym or a supermarket. You know, and we're also partnering, we're part of the Ionity partnership, which is rolling out that rapid ultra, ultra rapid. Uh, Ionity chargers do sort of glow, they glow in the dark, yes. 150 kilowatt charges. So there's, you know, they're gonna, we're going to have, I think, 10 retail sites around the country um, by next year that, that also have those. So, so the idea is... Uh, you know, let's let's learn. And, and then the most exciting, one of the most exciting things right now is um, our project Evelyn. So that is taking um, an existing forecourt in London and taking out all of the conventional fuels uh, pumps and replacing them all with um, with 10, 150 kilowatt chargers. So basically creating an EV charging hub in London and seeing how that works. And, and of course, if you're going to, you know, you're going to do that, you, you're going to need a really nice, um, place for people to hang out and use wireless and have a decent cup of coffee and some nice food. So we've got a, a really cool and very funky designed um, sort of shop and, and um, hangout area. So it's trying to get all of that together. And then, and then we see, we, we, we continue to be surprised by what we learn. And, and this is sort of what it's about in a new market. There's an element of kind of learning as you go. Yeah. Cause, so when is that due to open then? Because I've, I've heard about that for a, a long time, or quite a while, the, the, the charging hub in London. Do you know, have you got a rough date? Well, I, actually, with where we are on COVID at the moment, I, so I'm hoping it would be by the end of this year, but it will be, it'll be 2021. Um, and again, you know, it's taking a little while um, to get the planning. So the planning has been submitted and, um, and we're doing some work on that. Um, so as soon as that planning permission gets granted, then, you know, we can, we can um, get on with, uh, doing the work on the site. I had this extraordinary tweet today, which was 
from I don't, I don't know the person they just sent it sent a tweet to me with a photograph of the guy he's plugging in his car and he's very excited and he said I'm I've never been interested in cars I don't care about them at all this is all your fault <laughs> you made me do it it's kind of a joke thing but he, he said oh, but I'm really loving it and I think that is a really important turning point because up to now anyone who's looked about it thought about it made the decision bought an electric car just as you're saying is is a very unusual customer generally because I, and I would put myself in the lower band of people who are interested in cars but i think that change is we're just starting to see it's the it's not the early adopters anymore there's people now buying electric cars who who aren't that bothered but they've heard that these are these are all right and they're now beginning to trust them and that's the where you'll see the growth in sales which we are seeing around the world you know, your ability to produce the fuel that you're selling in a in a forecourt if you like which is what you do now but what about electricity? Because you could produce the electricity that you then sell to the customer in the forecourt. I mean, is there, I know you do, I know you do some of that, but I mean, is there sort of bigger plans to do, to, to scale that up? There are, there are. So, so, so when we look at what are the opportunities, I suppose, in, in an energy system that's going to rapidly, de, you know, it's going to decarbonize over the next, well, it's starting already and it's going to continue for the next couple of decades, then um, you clearly see that um, you know, electrification is a massive opportunity. And so, so one of our one of our sort of stated um, strategic ambitions is, is to build a, you know, a, a large integrated power value chain. And, and that means that means just as you said, um, that, that we would have a position in the generation side of it, low carbon, renewable generation. We would, and we already do have, um, but we'll continue to grow us, um, um, a, a big division doing power marketing and trading and optimization and managing flexibility and all of those complicated things, all the way down to selling it to the customer, both the sort of B2C through, for example, yeah, the EV chargers, but then also the B2B, so uh, industry, you know, industrials and, and commercial. So it's actually, that is, that's one of our, our growth areas going forward now is that we, we have that integrated value chain. And, and I mean, we're not, we're doing quite nicely on that today. So our Shell Energy Europe, which is our, our trading arm, they, um, they procure um, uh, both sort of, well, power, um, I guess, green power and other colors of power from from, uh, from generators in the uk and and they supply all of our ev charges on the retail sites as well as all the retail sites and in fact all of our offices and all of our operations with 100 percent renewable power so we're sort of we're building it's a building block thing it's going to take us time to put all of the pieces together but in the uk we've actually got you know a really sizable power trading um, and procurement business and then we're more and more reaching out reaching out into the um the customer space and of course we bought we bought uh, a company which was called first utility and we renamed it to shell energy retail limited so that's our sort of first foray in the uk into the whole um, retail power and um, energy space so, so yeah so there's a there's a, a lot of work going on so today we've got about eight hundred and fifty thousand customers i guess in the in shell energy retail and again they've all got 100 percent renewable energy so uh, sorry eight hundred fifty thousand customers that who are effectively as i would understand like domestic users who it's their houses you, they buy their electricity from from they buy it from us and so all the electricity is 100 renewable um and and recently launched a, a sort of a carbon neutral offering so you can have your gas all the emissions associated with your gas that you buy you know offset through purchasing carbon offset so so that that's a business that um we're quite excited about it's it's early days, but UK is one of the markets where we, we would do want to grow a, a, a sizable business there. And then it all starts to connect together. So, you know, we're selling EV chargers through Shell Energy Retail and we've got a, an EV charging tariff. And so, so we're trying to link these businesses together so customers can have a, a more integrated offer, whatever they drive and, you know, whatever their energy needs are. But it is interesting that Shell's, uh, I think Shell and BP, those two companies certainly struck me as being slightly more uh, progressive in their attitudes to the, the climate to accepting the science basically because who works for a big company like Shell a lot of scientists that's really right the notion of peer-reviewed you know research and and, uh, and and data and that stuff you can see it I'm, I'm assuming that's one of the things I think quite surprises people when they when they have a lot to do with Shell or, or join the company is it is a company full of scientists and engineers and 
everybody is very data driven, evidence based, and 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 a lot of people are pretty knowledgeable on energy transition, energy transition, and very passionate about being part of wanting to make it happen. And, and society is impatient, and and there's no doubt we do need to move faster, right? I mean, full stop as a country and as a world, if we're really going to to, to keep global temperature rises to, to close to one and a half degrees. Um, but I think a growing number of, of companies have have um, have realised just what an important role they have in this, and so that's absolutely the energy companies, and absolutely I think the Total, Equinor, BP, Shell. There's a number of of companies that are looking at that transformation now. But it's also the other big companies like the Microsofts and the Amazons and the, and the DHL, and that matters for us because. One of the things you get a lot of challenge on is, you know, you guys need to get out of oil and gas quicker. You need to move quicker. And and, and the thing I spend a lot of time saying is supply and demand. How, it's it's a bit of a three-legged race with policy. We all have to move together. There isn't there isn't a business case for running off and and um, putting in a thousand charge points in 2010 if you've not got any EVs. You know, you, all of this has to hang together. And so when you see big companies, they're our customers. So when they want to get to net zero, they're then talking to us about, well, how do we do that? Who's going to, will you supply us with the renewable um, energy? Can you do a deal on sustainable aviation fuels? You know, all of a sudden our customers are, are asking, and that allows us, of course, to invest, to invest. Uh, so, so it is very much that all kind of going together. And, and that's, so I think the last few years have changed that beyond recognition. Before there were there were some you know there were some there was some pull but but it wasn't it wasn't as widespread or coherent as it is today so that's and that's what and that's what things like net zero get you because that's what we see in the UK yeah once you legislate for net zero yeah, when it was eighty percent there was quite a lot of interesting scenarios around how you got an eighty percent reduction in emission you know CO two equivalent emissions in the UK. Um, but that 20% was all to play, right? So maybe maybe you have it in mobility, maybe you have it in industry. Now you don't have anywhere to play, you don't have any 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 headroom. You've got to decarbonize everything. And, and that has focused, I think, policymakers as well as business um, and, and and scientists and engineers. And scientists and engineers are pretty good. Give them give them a give them a problem to solve and, and the right sort of policy framework and the right investment and, and we're pretty good at solving. So, so you, the net zero has really changed the uh, mindset and hence I think now we're beginning to see the sort of acceleration of policy and investment that we, we need. And would you say that is, a, as far as you understand it, relatively global as opposed to it's not just sort of, you know, what the wealthier European countries. I mean, I'm fascinated because I've not been there and I don't know, but I spent some time in India a couple of years ago. You know, you walk along the streets in Mumbai and you go, they really could do something about air pollution. Probably would make their lives better. Uh, nothing else. I'm not saying, else. you know, I mean, is there, I don't know if there is similar desire amongst the general population to try and improve things i'm sure they must be i i i think it does feel and is quite different in different markets and, and so you, you get the and this is a sort of thing that i think is quite an important point that you know different countries will move at different speeds and and that's okay you know and the speed that a country like india moves right, versus the speed of the of the uk you know you it's determined by what your natural resources are your your where you are in the economic development curve what your industrial base is yeah but their individual as individual and indian their co2 footprint is minuscule in compared to as in compared to mine and i've got solar panels and electric car and all that mine is still massive in comparison it is and, and and if you look at like if you think about the fact that electrification you know uk is going to have to electrify a lot of what we do in our heating and our cars and 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 that's we have a although we need to do some strengthening and upgrades you know we have a we have a world leading sort of grid and grid system operator and uh, you know but if you if you're in india you know access to any sort of energy in some parts of india or africa you know people are worrying about just access to energy and and affordable and reliable energy and 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 yes they'd like it to be clean but they're more concerned about having it so 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 there's a bit of a sense of well why should the uk do this when india and china are doing that but that that's 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 not a fair representation of what needs to happen they, and also if you look at the sort of um the amount hundreds of gigawatts of solar that india is planning to put in and if the china's putting in an offshore wind china's looking at 
you know, it's, it's absolutely massive, but it's in the context of a billion plus people. So they'll still have coal in the system for a while. Um, they will use a lot more gas, which hopefully will displace that coal. And then, you know, and then as we develop the technologies, that creates a massive export potential. Yeah. So, so there's sort of there's industrial benefit to the UK and economic benefits to the UK. But there's also a huge export potential for countries that are a little bit further behind. So, so I think we need to sort of we do need to break different countries down. You would expect the EU and UK and, and indeed the US, which despite some of the you know, political sides of things, is actually moving quite fast in many states like California. Yeah, so so you'd expect that the, we are the we are the sort of the regions and the countries that will move quicker, um, and we need to help other countries. Um, and develop the technologies that help other countries um, come to. But you have to allow them um, economic development. It's just they have to do. I heard Mary Robinson say this once, and I thought it was very well put. You have to uh, allow them their economic development and help them have it at a far lower carbon footprint than ours. And I mean, that is the, what, the one thing that you could imagine being possible in, say, the next 10 years in a similar way to cell phones, because that was the first thing I noticed in Mumbai and in, and in rural India, I'd be walk, I walked down a little lane in this tiny little town. I was doing a documentary for the BBC. Like, no, where, so you, when you end up, when you do things like that, that's the good, the good side of it, is you end up where tourists definitely don't go. Because <laughs> the towns we were in, they, you could tell they had not seen st streams of white tourists walking through that town. They're just staring at me open mouth. They're so lovely and friendly. But so many of them, so many of them had smartphones. Just, I, I mean, I, basically 90% of people were holding one. And then you think they had no legacy of copper wires, of telegraph lines, of switching stations, of, of you know, all that. They didn't have that. And they've jumped that thing. Well, that's the, I've heard that theory argued that they'll, they'll jump to solar because they didn't have, they haven't got to get rid of the power lines and the coal burning power plants. They've never had them. And you do, you see that, you see that in, a, a, in more and more in, in, in parts of Africa and India. Um, and there are really there are companies like oh gosh D Light or or M Copa and, and you know, they're providing you know the, the entry level is is just that it's a solar a solar powered light with like a maybe a, a an iPhone charger um, and then of course you know you can add to that and get a slightly larger solar panel and get a battery and and of course they are utilizing mobile mobile technology in that because because everybody's paying for these um this sort of these um solar home um energy systems um they're using pay as you go through their through their phone all of a sudden because people are um connected you can actually you, you've got a business model there that companies can 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 leverage to to roll out um you know to millions of people now these sorts of off-grid um home solar systems so so yeah there'll be there'll be parts of the world that never see the sort of energy system that that we had today and then there'll be a certain amount of of grid technology probably required in in cities and the like so it's about getting that that balance correct i think we're not going to stop extracting fossil fuels out of the ground because it's too useful but my argument has always been can we not burn it <laughs> can we use it in other ways you know uh, to do more useful things because that's the what i find fascinating is how you transition just the scale of it so you you're producing all this fuel at the this liquid fuel at the moment but the plan presumably is that that will gradually you will be producing less of it because people are going to be using less but that's got to transition you know as a company getting the money in from other sources Yes, it, it, it really is. And, and, you know, if you look at where we are today in the world, you know, fossil fuels provide about over 80% of all our energy needs, right, which is enormous. I just, it is quite mind boggling. And, and all the work that we've done in our sort of scenarios, which try to just look at the different possible ways of getting to a net zero world. You know, they would say that probably by, you know, by the time we're at a net zero world, fossil fuels can't make up and much more than about 20, 25 percent. But, but they'll still probably be 20, 25 percent of the energy mix. And that energy, that energy um, demand will probably be a little bigger than it is today. So, so and, and that's not a popular message, but, but, but it reflects where we see reality. It, it reflects um, moving really fast in the areas where we 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 know what we need to do, you know, in power, in the power system, in mobility, uh, particularly light duty and and you know light vans, etc. But it also reflects that we don't really have the solutions yet for shipping. That aviation is going to take a really long time. You know, there's some interesting. Um, uh, we always think about everything in the sort of a you know avoid, reduce, and sort of offset your emissions. And so it, you know the aviation side of things, it's going to be about reducing for quite a while with more efficient engines and airplane design and then you're going to need to start 
bringing in more sustainable aviation fuels, which have a, you know, which are sort of biofuels and they come from sort of more sustainable sources. And then maybe one day you get to hydrogen or electric planes, but it's, it's decades and decades of, of innovation and research and demonstration. So, so that means in 2050, there'll still be a fair amount of aviation. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think, because you're, you're a young woman, you will, you will live long enough to see, to be able to say, fly to Vienna without, you know, possibly in a purely electric plane, but you're none of us, no one who's alive today is probably going to live long enough to fly to New York or Sydney like that, unless, I mean, because the breakthrough in technology is just unimaginable at the moment. But there's, I mean, there's some great stuff happening, and 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 I think now that the world has, well, now that you see so many governments get so serious, and you have Paris, you are seeing an awful lot of money flow into innovation and research. But but you know, it, gosh, just getting a plane through all of the safety checks to to do, you know, it's gonna, yeah, it's I think it's decades away. And then likewise, with you know, we use um, there's quite a, a, a things like producing cement and, and steel, which are fairly fundamental to this world we live in, they are quite carbon intensive. So, so again, what, you know, we're going to need solutions for those, um, which probably comes down to carbon capture and storage and the like. So, so yeah, there's, there's, um, there's quite a, a challenge in what we call this, the harder to abate, you know, the, the areas where, you know, even big trucks where we don't as yet have the answer. And, and even when you get the answer, you're then going to have to uh, scale that up, get the cost down so it competes against the fossil fuel equivalent, and then you're going to have to grow global manufacturing capacity. So again, it's going to happen. It's just going to take time. And meanwhile, there's going to be fossil fuels in the system. And so it's our job to produce them um, in as energy efficient and sort of low emission way as we can, you know, fundamentally. And, as, and, you know, and so that's because we, we've got to... It, it, it's a problem for now, so we have to reduce as many tons of CO two as we possibly can going into the environment starting today. But then, so the other topic that I would love to cover with you is hydrogen, because it is it is such a uh, it's it's such a volatile fuel, and I mean that both <laughs> both in its chemistry and in its polit- political thing, because it's become this weird thing. The second ever electric car I ever drove was the Honda. Clarity. It was a great car, the, the Clarity, and the, and so is the Toyota Mirai, and so is I've driven a, a Hyundai fuel cell car. They are all they are basically like driving electric cars, but they go a bit further than than we currently can on batteries. But it was my argument has always been where does the hydrogen come from? Because at the moment, I think you will be able to verify this. About ninety five percent of commercially available hydrogen. If you buy, if you order a can of hydrogen here now, it will be it will be from uh, natural gas. It, it will. It'll be from natural gas, and they we call it grey hydrogen. So it's hydrogen that has quite a quite a. It has a, certainly got a carbon footprint. And my argument has always been: if I'm cycling along a road and there's 50 cars in a traffic jam, and I'm cycling through it, but they're all hydrogen fuel cell cars, that's a win. We have. We do have three sites in the UK with hydrogen fueling sites on them, um, and and there are some Mirai's and and whatnot out there that are using them. So so I guess where we where we we're we're pretty bullish on on hydrogen, um, but in the context of we think that um, where you ca- where we can electrify, we will. Yeah, that, that that's the most efficient sort of end-to-end um, uh, way of doing things, and so that means that certainly um, um, a lot of the light duty in the car space will be be EVs. Um, although we probably still, we, we do see still the space for hydrogen in there, you know, fleets, people who live in, you know, a lot of the high mileage in the UK is done by rural drivers living out, you know, and, and particularly in Wales and Scotland. And, and you might get to the point where it is actually more sensible to have some hydrogen refueling sites and, and have hydrogen cars for very large amounts. If you're doing 50,000 miles a year, that may be a better option. So, so we still do see a role for hydrogen cars, but in long mileage um i think and maybe sort of and, and maybe in parts of the country where where you know, it's difficult to get the ev charging infrastructure that we need um but where we see the real win for hydrogen is absolutely in heavy duty yeah so, so it, it's very clear to us that exactly to your point there are what there are um uh, buses i think very interesting and we're trying those around the uk obviously in aberdeen in london or, or with right right bus and others are, are, are rolling those out um absolutely large sort of trucks that come across you know that drive across europe that go from scotland down to down to cornwall um and and there there we 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 see that there's sort of gray hydrogen is obviously not a sustainable option to 
too high in CO2 in terms of a net a country with a net zero emission. But but they are as blue and they're as green hydrogen. And, and um, we would see both blue and green hydrogen playing a big role in, on the supply side. So, so green hydrogen um, comes from electrolysis. And, and there the business model would be ultimately that you'd be connecting offshore wind directly to enormous electrolyzer and producing large volumes of green hydrogen. And, and in fact, we've just... Um, We've just won a very large offshore wind bid in the Netherlands. And as part of that project, we're looking to put a very large electrolyzer onto our refinery um, um, in Rotterdam, 200 megawatts, which is very significant. And that will that will provide hydrogen that will supply the refinery, but will also provide hydrogen for heavy duty vehicles. And we're trying to build out a hydrogen network in Europe for that purpose. So you can see that that all starts to work. Um, but in the but in Europe and the UK, um, electrolysis hydrogen Produced by electrolysis, green hydrogen, it's pretty expensive at the moment, um, and it's and so so a few things have to happen. Um, you need cheaper green electrons, which as we build out more and more offshore wind, and we have more and more windy nights when nobody wants electricity, we will get. So so that comes with scale of offshore wind and renewables, um, and then you need to work on yeah the cost and the efficiency of electrolyzers. And again, there's a lot of research going on to that, and you would expect that they would follow the same sort of cost curve that batteries and offshore wind has followed. But so that's going to take a while. But through the 30s, you would expect to see the cost of green be pretty competitive. And in the interim, blue hydrogen um, is uh, considerably more cost effective. Um, and that's produced from natural gas, but you capture the CO2 with carbon capture and storage. And, that, and does that technology exist now, the carbon capture? Because that's that's an area that I haven't really focused on, but, but it's often a term that's often used. Although I saw a carbon capture system at Imperial College a few years ago. We got one built in there as a, for the students to work on. Yeah, 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 no, it exists. There's about, there's probably, I think there's about 21 CC, like commercial scale CCUS projects around the world. Um, we, we operate one in, in Canada, which I think, you know, is captured about 5 million tonnes of CO2. So yes, the technology is not that complicated, actually, it exists. And uh, you need reservoirs that you can store the CO2 in. You obviously need the wells and the pipeline. And the UK is fantastically well placed for that because, of course, our legacy um, oil and gas industry here. So, so yes, there's a couple of carbon capture and storage projects. Actually, there's several carbon capture and storage projects being being worked in the UK at the moment. We're involved in, um, in two of them, one in Scotland, one in Teesside. Uh, and, and actually, Committee on Climate Change has been very positive about the fact that carbon capture and storage is a necessity, not an option. You can't get to net zero without it. You need it for industry. You need it for it's a cross-cutting technology, so it's one of those technologies that you just you sort of need it almost everywhere at some point. But it, the difficulty is getting the first project launched, and so we're working with government now on the business models for that. But hopefully, we'll get a clean gas project away, and there'll be a, um, a hydrogen project away in in the next few years. And then you'll start to get the scale with blue, and then the green piece will come as offshore wind grows, and and then you can decarbonize quite a lot. So yeah, so it's going to take time. There's a lot of excitement about hydrogen, um, um, and it's sort of been it's been around for a long time. And we started rolling out hydrogen refueling stations in California. Oh my gosh, probably 10, 15 years ago, um, and they've been a little bit slow uh, to use, as you can imagine. Um, but that's that's starting to change now. That's it. Next week, next week, at some point, it has already flown. But I'm going to go and see its second flight. So, uh, which is the hydrogen fuel cell plane, which is the first time that's been done. Zero AV, yeah, which is fantastic. They're, they're, and, you know, it is small. It's obviously not a, not a large passenger jet. But I think that is the area that I think when I first got interested in this whole area, the whole kind of energy transition, electric cars, I definitely didn't ever cross my mind that there would be, you know, even small electric planes, let alone bigger ones and bigger and bigger. And the stuff that uh, uh, Airbus Industries are working on and Boeing, you know, you just go, wow, that is, I never would have guessed that 10 years ago. Even in the last, even yeah, in the last week or two, right? With this flight with Airbus, there's been a there's been a, a number of really exciting announcements about the concepts that come, you know, concepts through to actual demonstrations. And and like as we're looking at, you know, what's the role for hydrogen in shipping? Because shipping is another really difficult one to crack. So so we see an awful lot of uses for it in as I say those those areas where today. Yeah, 
it's it's difficult to see the technological solution there's 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 quite a bit of what we need to do that we can do if you like within national boundaries yeah like decarbonizing power and going after your 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 cars and then there are pieces like aviation or shipping where it's 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 got to be an international Kind of cooperation deal because if you think about you know shell could decide to go hell for leather after new new fuels for ships but we need we need ship makers and engine makers we need people to build the engines and design the ships around them and the ports and the fueling infrastructure and it's no good if it's fantastic in rotterdam but by the time it gets to singapore or even gibraltar there's no fuel so you've got that whole reality of actually and that's something that i think has really come to the fore in the last year or two which is you're going to need these sectoral kind of collaborations between governments and fuel providers and OEMs and shipbuilders and airplane builders and we're going to have to work out how we do this and we're going to have to join forces on a lot of the technology and the innovation and governments are going to have to work together on some of the enabling policy because if you just leave this to individual parts of that puzzle it, it, it is really difficult to see how we do this and so so there's been there's actually a coalition called i think getting to zero which is trying to put the first zero carbon ship on the sea doing those sort of you know long distance um uh, trade routes by 2035 and we're part of that with maersk and the danish government and lots of others um and there are similar partnerships in in aviation because that you, that you kind of need the ambition and then you need um but shell's actually also a partner um on the first um first ship that's fueled with liquid and hydrogen that will that was meant to go to japan for the olympics so um, um we'll see how the olympics go and and how that's progressing but what we have um, we've also been working on that so we're kind of involved in quite a lot of these early stage demonstrations of okay well let's 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 build a ship with those who know how and you know see how how this works yeah that is so exciting so that is the exciting position you're in because i mean obviously i know a lot of the kind of the and i think they're i support them and i think they're amazing the kind of startup local uk based energy companies that are doing innovate innovative things with tariffs and charging infrastructure and all that but it is very super local it is this one small island off the coast of europe you know that that whole thing whereas you, you know when and it is that scale of thinking that if you a company like shell is capable of being aware of and understanding the infrastructure that requires that simply because of the history you've had in the past you know it, it it really is and and but the, but the reality of this is of course that you know we need those innovative startups and and because they're coming up with some of the really cool tech that then you know we, we we've bought quite a few and we're partnering with quite a few because again they've got some amazing tech and we've got scale i just before we go because you've been so good so generous with the time Shanae, but i just want to know where you how you personally came into this world and what you did before and what, what your background is. I mean, I'm a, uh, so I went to the University of the West of Ireland. So I'm a geophysicist, I'm a physicist by training. And then I joined British Gas, uh, the old British Gas as a geophysicist. Um, and, and actually joined them as a graduate in 93 and stayed there until they were bought by Shell in 2016. So, um, so, so, and, and did sort of move from, I was techie for a decade, very technical, and then I moved into more commercial and business type roles. And I, I'd just been offered a role on the BG Executive Committee when uh, Shell, yeah, when our board announced they were <laughs> recommending Shell by the company. Um, and so then I, um, I worked on integration of the companies for a year or so, and then I joined Shell into this role as country chair. So, um, so yeah, so very, very technical in my, in my sort of first decade and then kind of very commercial and businessy in my second. And then I think, you know, kind of totally absorbed in energy transition and the new business models to, to drive decarbonization as well as lots of other elements in, in the role I have today. So uh, that's what that explains a lot. So, I mean, I think it's also probably very useful if you're, uh, if you have a technical background like that, I mean, it gives you such a good grounding in what needs to be done, what can be done, what is a bit of, you know, so, sort of thing that uh, someone like me going, we should just, you know, just use solar on a solar panel on the top of your car. I mean, when you, when I hear things like that, I now understand, but there was a time when, why don't you just put a solar panel on then you don't have to do anything. Yes, we need a solar panel about the size of a tennis court. Yeah, no, I, I, it's exactly right. And that's what I'm always saying. I, you know, I'm always sort of encouraging people to think about careers in science and engineering because you never know where you're going to end up, but it's such a brilliant foundation. So, um, yes, I'm always very keen to encourage, um, 
you know, we don't have enough women in the oil and gas industry. We don't have enough diversity overall, actually. And, and so, um, and yet, you know, there are in energy as a whole, there are so many amazing jobs that you can do if you get that science or engineering technical background to start with. But thank you so much for talking to us. It's really, really good to talk to you, you know, It really is fascinating. I, I kind of knew it would be. And I kind of didn't, I hope you don't mind, because I kind of didn't want to structure it with a, like a series of questions. It was, I know it was a bit of a ramble, but we covered a lot of areas and you've been very generous with your time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Oh, no, I enjoyed it hugely. Thank you very much for having me, Robert. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that. It was certainly a fascinating conversation uh, from my point of view. I learned a lot. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly looking forward to going to see the uh, first Shell charging hub, which is in sort of pretty central London. I don't know where. They haven't told me. I don't, I'm not party to any inside information, but I know it's sort of inside the M25 in London. So it's in sort of greater London somewhere. And they're using the site of an existing, and as I was told very clearly, profit-making petrol station, as we would call it, in this quaint old island off the coast of Europe. Anyway, that is all. There will be another uh, show next week, and I think it is going to be hyper interesting. I haven't recorded it yet. I'll record it tomorrow. I'm quite nervous because the person I'm interviewing is searingly clever and knows an enormous amount about the energy transition and the transition to non combustion vehicles. You're going to love it. To do subscribe to the Fully Charged Show podcast. I would hate for you to miss this episode. It is going to be amazing next week. Anyway, uh, that's all for now. Have a look at the Fully Charged Show on YouTube if you've come across this podcast randomly and you didn't know that we've been making a video show on YouTube for the last 10 years. Uh, go and have a look at that. And also there will be a, a link to Patreon in the show notes beneath this uh, show, which is your, everyone is now very used to. I don't expect anyone to do anything, but it is an amazing lifeline for us, particularly this year. It's, it's what's keeping us going. I'm hugely grateful to our wonderful many Patreon supporters, without whom I wouldn't be here talking to you on this microphone technology. That is all. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening.